Yeah, first of all, this is joint work with Karim, who's sitting there, and he's giving the next talk. So if you have questions, you can ask directly <laughs> him after my talk. And this is a talk about universality, maybe not the same notion that we have been using so far. And there's, yeah, there's a universality conjecture of Shefford, <coughs> and then there is a universality theorem of projecting the unique polytopes. And just so that we are all in the same page, just the s s small definition slide that you, most of you know everything. So a polytope, just the convex hull of a, of a finite set of points in R to the D. If we intersect our polytope with a, an affine hyperplane that contains the whole polytope at one side, we get a phase. These phases, we have a partially ordered set. So for example, with this polytope, this is the partially ordered set. And that's what we call the phase lattice. And I'll say that two polytopes are combinatorial equivalent if they have the same phase line. And actually, technically, my polytopes have labels on the points. So when I say that they are combinatorial equivalent, I mean as labeled point configuration. So this phase lattices have labels on these points. OK, so that's everything you need to know to start this talk. And this is a universality conjecture of Shefford. Uh, this is Shefford. 1984, it's the only picture I could find of him. And I'll talk about the small paper of Shefford from 1974 called uh, Subpolytopes of Stack Polytopes. I think it has six pages or something like that, this paper. And it starts more or less, uh, oh no, yeah, sorry. Let me tell you what the stack polytope is before. So, well, nowadays we call it stacked. He called it stack, but I can't pronounce the difference anyway. So a stack polytope, you get it by start with the simplex and now put the point very close to a facet of the simplex. You, you get a new polytope and you keep doing that on facets. So you get your stack polytope and you find a point which is extremely close to a facet of the, of the stack polytope and you get a, a new polytope. That's a stack polytope. And they are important for many reasons, mainly because they are those that have the minimal number of facets among all simplicial polytopes. This well, I mean, it is a combinatorial definition, but what I told you is a way to realize them. But, uh, yeah. I mean, of course, the this, this second definition, which is a connected sum of, of simplices. But it's exactly the same as I said. Um, and what does he say in his paper? He starts something like this. It says, well, the investigation to be described is start with the following question, who was asked uh, to Shefford by a very well-known mathematician. And the question is, is every subpolytope of a stack polytope a uh, stack polytope also? And he never says who's this very well-known mathematician, probably because this question is nonsense. And the next thing that he says is, well, this is clearly false. Uh, and, I mean, he tries first with a cube, and a cube is a subpolytope of a stack polytope. A cube is not stack. He says, well, let's try if the polytope was simplicial. He tries with an octahedron, which is not a stack, and it's also a polytope of a stack polytope. So, I mean, the paper was extremely short, so he had to do something else and said, well, let's try if I can get every polytope as a subpolytope of a stack polytope. Now, this is an interesting question. And <coughs> actually, he, the answer is no. And he proves that there are three dimensional polytopes that are not a subpolytope of a stack polytope. And I actually think that his proof is very neat. And let me just sketch how he does it. He starts with a very round polytope. And a very round polytope is a polytope that is in between these two spheres, which are very close one of the other. So all your polytope is here. And first, he proves that if these are close enough, every supper polytope of this polytope, so every polytope such that this is a subpolytope of that polytope, has all its vertices also very close to the sphere. And this closeness depends on this closeness. The next thing he says is, well, now take a stack polytope. Since you have this connected sum of simplices, there's one of the simplices that contains the origin. Take that simplex. And now, essentially, you find that <coughs> that polytope is not very close to a sphere. So if this is extremely close, it cannot be a subpolytope of a stack polytope. And that's his point. OK, so 
he, that the main result of this paper, but he continues with saying, well, it, it's not true that every polytope is a subpolytope of a stack polytope. It could be true that every combinatorial type of polytope could appear as a subpolytope of a stack polytope. And uh, he says that at least that's what he thinks in dimension three should happen. And this is the conjecture we're going to attack. This is every polytope a combinatorial equivalent to subpolytope of a stack polytope. Actually, in dimension three, this is true. And we will see today that in dimension five, it's not true. So this is uh, a false universality conjecture. There is no universality in subpolytopes of a stack polytope. Well, in dimension three, unknown. Right? Yes, it's unknown so far. <coughs> OK. And the tool I'll use is projectively unique polytopes. So, well, this is, has appeared these days uh, quite often. The realization space of a polytope is the set of all polytopes that are combinatorially equivalent to the given polytope. It's a subset of R to the ND. We can think what's inside this set of realizations of a polytope. And I mean, let's say if, if my polytope was Q, every affine transformation of Q would be also in the realization space. But also every valid projective transformation would be all, also in this realization space. So essentially, this is always there, and you want to factor this out in some sense. And this is the concept of projectively unique polytopes. So those that have only one realization up to projective transformation. So that every realization of a projectively unique polytope is a projective transformation of this, projectively, of this polytope. So let me give an example of a projectively unique polytope is the, the square. If you have anything which is looks like a quadrilateral, just take these diagonals, they intersect at one point, just take these two edges, they intersect at one point, send this line to infinity, and you have already a parallelogram, and then you just need to scale it to get a, a square. For example, the pentagon, on the other hand, is not uh, projectively unique. Uh, one way to you see this is how Karim showed me is if you take the regular pentagon, this cross ratio is, is not rational. And this is a rational pentagon, so every cross ratio is rational. OK. I mean, what else could I say? So you can think how rare it is to be projectively unique. Like in the plane, there's only triangles and squares. I think in dimension three, it's a finite number, and, and then we don't know. But he'll talk more about this. So one of the first apparitions of projectively unique polytopes was this used by Pearls. Uh, we saw this picture yesterday. Um, he used this picture to prove that there are polytopes that cannot be realized with, uh, with rational coordinates. And these white points are related to something which is called the Lorentz extension and will appear uh, later. Um, OK, so there are polytopes that cannot be realized uh, with rational coordinates. How bad can this be? So how can, what can this get? And the answer is uh, by Tarski seidenberg theorem that, well, at least every polytope has one realization with algebraic coordinates. OK, <coughs> so now we have a projectively unique polytope that has essentially only one realization. And we have that every polytope has one realization with algebraic coordinates. Well, if our projectively unique polytope must be projectively equivalent to this realization with uh, algebraic coordinates, and therefore all its facets or its faces too. So we know that every phase of a projectively unique polytope is projectively equivalent to an algebraic polytope. So a polytope with all the vertices uh, with algebraic coordinates. And the, our universality theorem for a projectively unique polytope is the following. It says that if you give me a, a, pro, a polytope which is projectively equivalent to an algebraic polytope, I can find a projectively unique polytope that has this polytope as a face. I mean, of course, you give me the face, uh, I will build a projectively unique polytope that has this as a face, but it's not a facet. So, I mean, the gap of dimensions could be huge. Right? It's not a, a claim. Yeah. Um, Yeah, so you, you give me you give me your favorite polytope with algebraic coordinates, even if it's not projectively unique. For example, this one. Oh, okay. 
and now I'll build a projectively unique polytope uh, with many vertices and in higher dimension that has a face which is <coughs> in the polytope that you gave me in, in the beginning. Algebraic coordinates, so that all the coordinates are algebraic numbers. And this is an if and only if because of this tarski Seidenberg yeah. theorem. So we cannot hope to get something better. Uh, you'll see. <laughs> okay. So the first thing we'll do is we'll take our polytope and we'll try to embed it in a projectively unique point configuration. So uh, we have seen this here projectively unique. I mean in terms of oriented matrix. So if every realization of, of a point configuration is the same order type, it's projectively equivalent to it. So for example, our favorite example. And now we want to take our polytope and embed it into projectively unique point configuration. So for example, our pentagon, which was not projectively unique, can be embedded inside this projectively unique point configuration. Well, the first step that we did was if the coordinates are rational, this is very easy. Because if you take like the, uh, the dilation of all the, all the lattice points in a dilation of the unit group, that is also always projectively unique from dimension 3 and on. Uh, but of course, there are, we said algebraic, and well, we, we already know how to solve this problem too. Uh, we have uh, von Stout, and we are now all of us experts on von Stout's construction, so I won't enter into details. So we have addition product, and essentially for every polynomial, we can find uh, its construction. That essentially says that if we ha find a configuration with this order type, like the corresponding point would be the root of that polynomial. And since we're looking now with oriented matrix, we also can compare with rationals and get exactly which is the root that we are interested in. So we can fix every coordinate. So we can put every algebraic poly every for every algebraic polytope, we can put its vertices inside the algebraic point configuration, a projectively unique point configuration. But of course, we want uh, a polytope and that, that our original polytope is a phase. Huh? And for this, we'll use a, a clever construction of Karim and Gunther Ziegler, um, which is based on Lorentz extensions, but it's not precisely Lorentz extensions. And I'll tell you why. So for those who don't know Lorentz extensions, is you take your favorite point configuration. You put it in a hyperplane, just like here. Now you choose one point and you lift it in a new dimension and replace it by two copies of that point. And you take the convex hull of that. If we start doing this, we, we eventually get in convex position. But of course, our original phase, which was this pentagon, it disappears, is lost. So we have to be a little more careful. And here, for example, when we do the extension on a point which is outside the convex hull of our phase, that works because we get things in convex position, eventually. <coughs> but if we do the Lorentz extension in, with a point which is inside our convex hull, then we have problems. Because it's when we do the extension, the new point is still I, it's not in, in convex position. The trick that, that Karim and Gunther invented is the following. It's just a clever trick is find a new point outside your hyperplane, where your point configuration is. You need to find a hyperplane here spanned by your points outside your polygon. So we want to do this one. And now just take the point configuration, which is the intersection of this cone of the vertices of your face with the new point and this hyperplane. This is still projectively unique. And now all the points that do not belong to your desired face are outside. And now we can do Lorentz extensions on all these points. And essentially, that's the trick. Uh, so now what we have made is we have embedded, we have taken our phase, we have embedded it in a projectively unique point configuration, and now we have find, found a projectively unique polytope that has this as a phase. <coughs> so this uh, solves the problem. And why is this construction? Well, the trick is that the thing is that you want to preserve the phase. And if you do it with points which are outside the convex hull of your, of your, of your face, that works. 
if you just do the extension on the points that are outside of your face. But if you use the points that are inside of your face, you don't get a convex position. But it's the same doing in primal or the Gale transform. That's the same. But you, you really need to be sure that you'll get a face. Otherwise, you don't get it. OK. So just to end the talk, how will we solve the problem with the stack polytons? We'll have to use the polar dual. And now, what's the polar of a stack polytope? Well, a stacking was to add a point close to a face. Uh, the polar dual operation is to truncate a vertex. So we'll iteratively truncate vertices of a simplex. We start with a simplex, we truncate, and now we can truncate this one. We can truncate this one. And this has the property that Every, if, okay, let me go in order. If my dual is a stack, then every one of its, the dual of every facet is a stack. So if this was made with a truncation, then every phase is also a truncation because we are just truncating if we are touching. Now, taking some polytops is also preserving this because we're just taking a, a phase out. So uh, eventually, if we have something which is projectively equivalent to a subpolytope of a stack, all its faces will also be dual to projectively equivalent to a subpolytope of a stack. But our polytope was projectively unique. So finally, we have just found, starting with Sheffard's counterexample, a polytope which cannot be a subpolytope of a stack polytope. And the steps is just start with Sheffard's polytope, a polytope that it's not a subpolytope of any stack, but not for combinatorial type, and then just fix the combinatorial type with projectively unique. And for this, we've used von Staudt, and then the construction of Adipraceto and Ziegler. And you get this polytope whose combinatorial type is not a subpolytope of any stack polytope. Um, what I just told you works fine. But we just don't, can't control the dimension because we have all this whole lot of Lorentz extensions. But I said at the beginning that we could find a five-dimensional counterexample. And for this, we just had to realize, I mean, I didn't know these theorems. There's a very nice theorem by Below and Dobbins. Thing, none of them published them yet. So Below, I don't think he will. It's in his PhD thesis. Dobby, it's, it's also in his PhD thesis, but now it's in the archive like, since uh, some months. And it says the following. <laughs> if you give me your favorite algebraic polytope in dimension D, there is a larger polytope in the hat builder in dimension d plus 2 that has p as a phase, and such that every realization of the large polytope, this phase is projectively equivalent to the original polytope. So the other phases can change, but this phase is always projectively equivalent to the fixed polytope. And with that, we start again with our Sheffer's counterexample in dimension 3, and we go up two dimensions, and we get a counterexample in dimension 5. And now the question, of course, is what happens in dimension four, and then try to find the minimal counterexamples. Because, I mean, of course, every time you do von Staudt, you add a whole lot of vertices. Uh, I don't know which is the minimal counterexample. It would be interesting to know. And, and that's it. I think I have like five minutes for Karim. <laughs>